particularly we're going to be looking at verses 15 through to 21. Last chapter in Genesis, chapter 15. And we know, at least I hope, that every person in this room looking around would know the story of Joseph. Joseph, the, the story of Joseph starts in chapter 37. So you've got a good 13 chapters, probably 12 chapters, I think there's one in between that talks about Judah. But there's a good few chapters there of Joseph, and you're probably pleased to know that I haven't got time to read all of those chapters to you. So I'm not going to read the whole story of Joseph, but I'm sure that you all have a fair idea of the life that he lived. And that the reality is that the story of Joseph, among many other stories, among many other people, in the scriptures, Joseph is what we might term a, a shadow or a type of Christ. Now, when you stand in the sun, depending on what time of day it is, it'll either be behind you or be in front of you, it'll be stretched out long or it'll be short. And the realities are that those shadows don't give us a, an exact representation of what we are, but they give us an outline. So when we see the shadows and the four, the four types of Christ in the scriptures, not everything about them is exact about who Christ is, but there are, there are bits here and there, parts of their lives that are very much Christ-like. So I'm going to read to you these few verses from verse 15 through to 21. Verse 15 then says, And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us, and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, so shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespasses of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, Forgive the trespasses of the, the servants of God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in the place sorry, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you. I will nourish you, he says, and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. So here we have a man of, uh, of God, a man who is a type of the foreshadow of Christ. So you might say, in what ways? Well, again, knowing the story of Joseph and knowing how it began, you will know that Joseph was the beloved son of his father. Jacob loved Joseph with all his heart. I think it says in there that he was the son of his old age. He loved him. He was his beloved son. And Jesus Christ, as we've seen many times over the New Testament, from the voice of God himself from the heavens, at his baptism for one occasion, opened up and said to the people that were around that he, that he, that he caused to hear, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. We know that he was quite a young man at the time, and oftentimes God, he was the firstborn. Jacob was the firstborn of his mother, and Jesus Christ is the first one. And then we see that Jacob gave him, I don't know what you want to call it, whether you want to call it a coat, looking probably a bit like Liz's top tonight, of many colours. I think no. 
actually, I'm not sure it does say the St. Many Colours. I'm not really sure where that came from. But it was certainly a glamorous overcoat type of thing. Something that was shown, it showed, it showed Jacob's love. It showed that he, he loved him with all his heart, that he was setting him aside as something special. So he had this, and he was the envy of his brothers. But Jesus Christ, at his baptism, was clothed from on high with his Father. He sent the Spirit of God in the form of a dove, at least that's how it appeared to John the Baptist. He saw the Spirit descend as though it were a dove upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know, as Ryan said this morning, that he wasn't given it in a small measure. That the Spirit of God was upon him like no other person. He was clothed by his Father. And it makes me think about envy. He was rejected, Joseph was, by his own brothers. He was rejected by those who were supposed to love him, who were a part of his family, who were his own kin. And it makes me think of the Pharisees. What was it that Pilate said about the Pharisees? about the chief priests and the scribes. He knew, it says, that they delivered him up to him for envy. And the brothers of Joseph were envious. They couldn't stand the guy. He came as a dreamer, and they thought the same thing of Jesus. Who is this dreamer? And they thought the same thing of Jesus. They said the same thing of Joseph, his own brothers. And what did his brothers do? They plotted against him. How are we going to get rid of this guy? And again, all over the Gospels, we see that there are attempts and talk behind his back. How are we going to get rid of this Jesus? And the reason, as Pilate said, was it was for envy. And then Joseph was cast into a pit. He was cast into a pit. What happened to Jesus? Jesus was nailed to a tree. He was crucified. And Joseph being thrown into the pit is, is a picture of Jesus Christ going down, being killed, dying. And that's what it is. All because of envy. All because of those people who were supposed to be his own kin. Were jealous. And they wanted to keep their own power. I mean, let's think about ourselves for a minute. How they worked out this firstborn issue in these families where they had more than one wife, I do not know. Because the inheritance always came to the firstborn. The firstborn son inherited all that was a father. So if you have two wives, three wives, as some of them had, and you had different sets of children, which one was the firstborn? I don't know. But there would have been great contention there. Reuben, particularly, was the oldest, I believe. And he was the one that would have had the rights to all that was Jacob's. The sons of Leah. They would have had much from Jacob. But he loved Joseph. I wonder, you know, if, if that was the issue. Whether it was about his inheritance, whether it was about money, whether it was about possessions, whether it was about whether they would inherit everything that was Jacob's physically, or whether it was about the fact that Jacob loved Joseph. Maybe he loved him more than his other brothers. Maybe that was the enemy. Maybe that was the jealousy. I don't know if there's ever been any sibling rivalry in this room, but maybe they were feeling pushed out by him. And what I'm saying is, maybe there was something there that you could understand. You see, when Joseph came along, in his immaturity, this is a part where there isn't, if you like, a part of the type of Christ. He was in his immaturity, he came and he said, look, I've had a dream. I've seen sheaves of corn, 12 of them. And I've got one. Oh, there's a, there's, a, there's a greater one. And all these twelve sheaves of corn all come and bow down to mine. 
Now you imagine that. You imagine how you would feel in the pride and the arrogance of our human heart. You would think, what on earth is this guy saying? And then he comes again, doesn't he? He even includes his, his father and his mother in this one. I had a dream and I saw the sun and I saw the moon and all the stars. And they all bowed down to me. That's what he was saying. But he was unwise. He was a young man and he was unwise. And he went and he told... Well, I mean, the first time was bad enough in one sentence. But the second time, you'd think he'd learned his lesson. But just like Moses, if you remember Moses, he went and he killed the Egyptian and he couldn't understand why, why, his, why his own people turned around and said, are you going to deal with me like you, what, like you dealt with the Egyptian yesterday? And he left, he left Egypt, he ran off and he, he couldn't understand. He, he thought that they would understand that he was the saviour, he was the, the redeemer of Israel. Of Israel. But, but he did it in his own strength. But he wasn't wrong. He was actually right about what he was saying and what he believed and what God had done in his heart and so was Joseph. But maybe he was just a little unwise. And he was cast into the pit. <clears throat> And then he was pulled out of it. Again, you can look into these things into themselves and you can see as, that is seen as, as a raising up the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But something that interests me about this particular part of the story of Joseph is it says that they've had a bit of a debate here. They, they were initially planning to kill him. They wanted to get him out of the way. I mean, if he's out of the way, that's it. He puts a stop to all of his dreams. And you know what it says in the scriptures about those prophets who say things are going to come to pass. And if they don't, don't believe them. They're not from God. So if, this were, if these dreams were true, if these prophetic dreams were true of Joseph, he couldn't die. And he didn't. Because they were true. He was proven to be right. But they decided instead that they would cast him into this pit decide what to do with him. And all the time, Reuben is there, trying to work a way around. He convinces them not to kill them, to kill Joseph. But then he says, kind of to himself, I will come back and rescue him later. Who does that remind you of when you look at the picture of Jesus? Jesus. Pilate. Pilate was trying, in a sense, to rescue Jesus. Rescue is probably the wrong word. But Reuben was the one that said, I'm, I'm going to try, I'm going to come back, and I'm gonna, I, you know, I, want, I want to punish him. He says, let's throw him into the pit. Let's punish the guy. Let's make him feel like he's coming to his wit's end. But later on, I'll come back and get him and return him to our father. Pilate said, didn't he? I find no fault in this man. I will take him outside, I will whip him, and I will let him go. I'll teach him a lesson, he said, but I will let him go because I find no fault. He was, in a sense, that picture of Reuben. He wasn't a Jew, he was a Roman. And we're talking about Little types here that fit into the story. He wanted to be he wanted to punish him. Reuben wanted to punish him. He was the firstborn, but he did not want to kill him. He did not want to kill him. And now the pilot. But such a man that he was, because he had more fear for the governor, more fear for Caesar than he did for God. He then handed him over. That they got a goat and they tore this goat apart. That's what they decided upon after they sold him to the Ishmaelites. They got a goat, they tore it in pieces, they tore his coat, they dipped it in this blood, and they took it home to their father. It's kind of a sacrifice issue. Something had to die. But you know also, 
that this points to for me? That these boys, these men, however old they were at the time, they killed a goat, they dipped his coat in the blood, they took it to the father. Because they wanted to conceal their sin. They wanted to deal with their sin. You know the reality is? The sacrifices don't deal with sin. And the sacrifices to come through Moses were not going to deal with sin. They killed the goat. They tried to hide it. But it would never deal with their sin. And no sacrifices of the Old Testament ever dealt with sin. So then he went off, buys him, he starts to, to leave all the things in his house all into his hands. And he does really well. I wonder what our attitude would be. Would we be plotting every they've left the door open, I'm, I'm making a run for it. This this man just submitted himself to the will of God. He'd done no wrong. He'd been sold into slavery. He'd been persecuted by his own family, his brothers. He was as though dead. And then in part of his house, he did well until his wife came along. And she tried to get him to lie with her. And he was man of righteousness. He would not do such a thing. And he said... He actually said, could, can I do this thing against Potiphar? That, he didn't say that. He said, could I do this thing against God? Remember what David said in Psalm 51, against you and you only have I sinned. He couldn't do it. But what did he do? What was his action when Potiphar's wife tried to grab a hold of him? He said no, he said no, he said no. And then one day she took a hold of him. Tried to force him to do what she wanted to do. And he ran. He ran from sin. But left his coat in her hands, and then all of a sudden, the accusations came. And so we see again, don't we, in the life of Jesus, all the way along the accusations that came. This man is a blasphemer. This man is trying to usurp the authority of God and Moses. And even when he was arrested, he was accused of all sorts of things. Not only of things that they twisted about what he said, but things that were false. They were looking for people to give false witness, to accuse him. And just like Joseph, Joseph did not go back to Potiphar, who he, who he was doing well with. He must have had a good relationship with him. He'd left everything in his hands. But he didn't go back and say, hey boss, I need to have a word. Your wife's lying. This is not me. I didn't do this thing. No, he didn't do that. And Jesus did the same thing when he was accused. He did not open his mouth. He took it upon himself to be accused by the wicked and to soak up. What would be the first thing that you and I would do when we're blamed for such grievous crimes? I know what I would do by nature. I would defend myself to the hilt. But he opened on his mouth. But all along, it says in the story of Joseph, the Lord was with him. 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 But after 10 years in prison, 10 years in prison, after the butler, or whatever he was, the cook there was probably better. He remembered that there was a man who interpreted dreams and he went to Pharaoh who had a dream and he interpreted the dream and all of a sudden this man is promoted to be the second in command of all of Egypt. He was in some senses the prime minister of the country. He became the saviour of men. Saviour of men. He became 
second to Pharaoh, Jesus Christ submitted to his Father. Jesus, in the sense of his essence and who he is as a person and the Godhead, is equal to God, but in his flesh, in his, in his role as the Saviour and the Messiah, he submitted himself to the Father. And so there we see, we see these types running all the way along this story. Joseph, in the wisdom that God gave him, prevented the deaths of thousands and thousands and thousands of people because of the plans for saving the grain and the barns and the storehouses. Many people travelled because they knew there was food in Egypt and Joseph's brothers were no different. Many people were saved because of Joseph. Many people, myriads of people, are saved because of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave his life, and in, in, same, in a similar way, not, not through death, but the whole course of Joseph's life had altered. He was, he was handed up by his brothers. And because of that, he had trouble after trouble after trouble. He was a slave, he was a servant, he was accused, he was in prison. I mean, imagine the life that he had until that day came. And he saved thousands upon thousands of people. And so in this portion here, we get to the verse, which is really what we're looking at, which is verse 20. And he says, but as for you, you thought evil against me. God meant it unto good to bring it to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. You know what we are in all of this? We're not just looking into this story. When we're looking at this and we're looking at the type being Christ, there's also us in this story. We are his brothers. That's what we are. I played one of them in the play years ago when I was 11 years old. And Joseph and the Amazing Temple and Dreamco at school I played J uh, Simeon. I had no idea then the reality of what it really means. Every single person here today is like one of his brothers, rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Of your own accord, of your own nature, you've all at one time rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you really understand? Him? Such as some of us were, it says in Ephesians. That's what we were. You weren't born saved. I don't know whether there are people in this room who can tell me the, the day that they were saved. I, I can't tell you a day. That there was a life that you've lived without him. A life that you've lived in envy and bitterness and hatred. And you might sit there and think to yourself, I don't ever remember hating Jesus. I don't remember going out of my way. But what about what Jesus says, you know, when you when you when you came and you fed me in prison, when you when you gave me water to drink and food to eat. And then, and then he goes on the negative. He said, when you didn't do that. And they say, hey, hold on, hold on. When, when, did we, when did we give that to you? Or, or when, when, did we, when, did, when did we see you hungry and not feed you? But we have, without a doubt, before he entered into our life, before he did the work in our hearts, before he revealed to you, if he has, who he is, just like one of the brothers of Joseph, actively in enmity against God. That's where we stand when we're not saved. That's where we stand before we know and come to a revelation of who he is, what he's done, and we pour out our hearts in repentance and we turn away from what we've always been. Repentance isn't just about saying sorry. 
repentance is about turning away from a life. A life that I previously chose. A life that I wanted to live. We have lived in desperate sin. And we have tried to be rid of Jesus in any way possible. Read these words again. These brothers, I just want to go to verse 15. Look, look, look what their heart was, their, their fear was. Verse 15. It said, When Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. What they're saying is, Now, now Jacob's gone. Surely. Jacob's going to repay us all the evil we did to him. That was their fear. How many times have we had the fear? Whether we have it now, I don't know. But have we had the fear before where you think, judgment. Jesus is going to requite us all the evil that we've done. That was their fear. And maybe tonight some of you still have it. As I spoke a couple of weeks ago, perfect love casts out fear. And yet we can still have a life with fear of judgment. And here this is, this is what they're fearing. He is going to pay us back all the evil that we did to him. Do we think that of Christ today? Do we think that of him? Because if we his, it's not true. And we see it in the response of Joseph. He says this, fear not. Am I in the place of God? There's a sermon, actually, in that one phrase. Am I in the place of God? I'm not going to go there at all now, but there is maybe many messages in that. But he says, fear not, am I in the place of God? But as for you, this is the key, this is it all coming to fruition. As for you, what you did, you meant it for evil. You sold me, you rejected me, you hated me without a cause. Uh, we've read all these in the chapter I was dealing with this morning. You've hated me without a cause, you've sold me. In some senses, you, you, you end, ended the life that I knew. What do we do to Jesus through our sin? We have to requite us. His response is, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. And then what happened with all the, the prophecies that Joseph had? You will come and bow down, your sheaves of corn, the stars, the sun will all bow down. Let me tell you, every star... Every sun, every moon that's across this universe will bow to the name of Jesus Christ. And we, today, if we're his, if we know him, we will bow the knee to Jesus Christ, as it says in this story. All the brothers, all those who previously rejected him, came on that day it was appointed, and they bowed the knee to Joseph. Just as he said they would. And Jesus has said the same thing. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue will confess. To the glory of God the Father. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. The evil that we did to Jesus. And it was evil. It is evil. And what the brothers did to Joseph was evil. But God made it and meant it for good. And so today, this is the place we stand. We stand in this place where, where Joseph turns and he says, He did it to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. And today, if you are in Christ Jesus, you are one of those people whom he has saved alive. Saved from death, saved from famine, saved from a certainty of starving to death. Interesting, isn't it? And I said this to Ryan the other day. If a ministry that preaches the gospel, the true gospel, the full gospel of Jesus Christ, people will start to flock as though they're in Egypt starving because they know that there's food. They'll come. But 
today. The question is, tonight, are you one of the brothers that's still in the place of envy and rejection and hatred and you want to get rid of him? Or are you one of the brothers whose hearts were melted and mended by Christ himself? Who saw when their eyes were opened and they saw it was Joseph. When your eyes were opened by him alone. Joseph, remember, had to reveal himself. And Christ has to reveal himself to you. I can't do that. He has to do it himself. But which place are you in? The place of envy, rejection and hatred are in that place where he revealed himself to you and you bow the knee because he's revealed him and you weep at his feet. My prayer is that it's the latter. But if it's not, no matter how long you have been in this church, no matter how long when people ask you what you believe and you say I'm a Christian, if you know the reality in your heart that's not true, Tonight's your night. Tonight's the night to turn. Turn away from that life that you live in rejection and to cast your life upon the Son of God. Believe on Him in your heart. Confess with your mouth. And anybody that does that, anybody that is led that way in truth through the gospel of Christ shall be saved. That's what the scriptures say. So my question then is, are you saved? Are you his? Are you bowing the knee and weeping for joy on your shoulder tonight? And I'll leave that with you.